Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to St Agnes. Welcome to everyone from Staffordshire. And everyone from Scotland. Welcome to all of you. Or welcome to Briannick, as I should say. Briannick is the, the Cornish name, the Celtic name for the settlement that became St Agnes. My name's Roger Radcliffe, and over the next 60 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey around St Agnes. We're going to start in the sea and on the sea. We're going to come back onto the coastline, up onto the cliffs, and then we'll look at the a little bit at St Agnes Village, and then we will finish by telling the story of Rosemundy House. I just love talking about St Agnes. And it's, it's so varied, you've got so much to talk about. Um, you know, whether it's the fish in the sea, whether it's actually the, the cliffs, the, uh, the bird life, all those wonderful areas of heathland on the cliff tops. And then you start to get into the stories of the people who shape the land. I try and put on a general uh, a range of topics from starting out in the sea from the fish that are out there right through to uh, you know the actual cliffs themselves the cliff tops all of the heathland and the lovely um, areas of outstanding natural beauty and then you come into the villages themselves and St Agnes and then well for the Rose Monday talk thanks to Clive uh, we've got all this lovely research and and the story of Rose Monday House is fascinating and and so um, well, tragic, you know, and interesting at the same time, in a way. The baby home is the one that I think that grabs people um, perhaps the most, you know, the fact that so many babies were born there. You know, there's, there's plenty to say. The stories of the families are fascinating, and I, I know various people in the village have done their family trees, and there's always a story. My great-grandfather apparently said that he, he was good at making pasties and when his wife died he had to fend for himself and he would make a pasty and he said he would make a pasty so big that he would have to put one end in the oven and the other end on a chair and then when the first end was done he'd turn it around and bake the other end which of course is absolutely true I'm sure. This is a photograph of my great-great-grandfather and essentially on the Radcliffe side of the family which is obviously my surname that's where our story begins really because he was he was um, in the employ of a man called Martin Tradinic Hitchens who was the principal shareholder of the harbour at St Agnes um, and Captain Robert Radcliffe he, he got his certificate in 1865 and uh, had well, he was master of a number of vessels, but um, he was taken on by Hitchens and he was captain of the Mary, which was a three-masted schooner. And then the one that um, a, a lot of people can relate to is the Trevellis, because it was built on the beach at St Agnes. So it was the, three, the only three-masted schooner that they built. And his son, Matt, took over, and Matt then had a, a son, Harold, and Harold had a son, Rex. Uh, and all of them, at one time or another, lived at number one, Stippy Stappy. Um, my great aunt, Auntie Kathleen, as we called her, she organized this photograph. And it's, um, it shows four generations. And I, I've tacked on Captain Robert Radcliffe on, on the end of it because I can show the five generations that I've just spoken of. Um, so with all that ancestry, I suppose to some extent it sort of comes in the blood, this interest in St Agnes. And I've always been a bit of a home bird anyway. So um, what I get quite a lot of satisfaction out of these days is actually trying to lift the lid on the story of St Agnes for those people who perhaps haven't got round to looking into it yet or haven't bought one of Clive Benny's books. Um, uh, and taking them out on walks and actually explaining something of the landscape as I understand it and telling some of the stories that those layers of history and all those families have left behind. And they're still there to be found. You know, it's amazing what you can still find. So the object of today is to get everybody onto the beach and before they leave, to just give them time to think about the way in which we're connected to the Gulf Stream 
and that sort of big conveyor belt of tides and currents that go around the the world really and and I'm gonna I mean I've got some finds in my pocket which I will reveal in case we don't find anything interesting on the beach but there will be interesting stuff to talk about definitely this one um, is is a very much a landmark building this engine house a single cylinder steam engine that operated a beam that powered stuff on the mine in that case it was pumping so it was pumping down a shaft that went right down below the valley bottom and it connected with us um, at about 840 feet so 840 feet down there was a sloping tunnel that connected with 880 below us and the mine behind us is Wheel Kitty and Wheel Kitty, the aim was to extend their workings under the valley into Wheel Friendly and on to Pole Barrow, which is the one across there with the roof on. And the roof over there was put on in 1937 and it stayed there ever since. There was a tiny little harbour there with two key walls that enabled small schooners to come in. Yes, at the museum. very it slender. And, and, yeah. Yeah. and the vessels couldn't turn around, so a vessel would get itself in, it would be pulled in under the cliff, the coal would be hauled up by means of horse-powered right. capstans, yeah. you know, so the horses would walk round around in circles and a big cable drum would be turned by their walking. There was a little mill, a grist mill for corn, set down in the valley here and the miller called um, William Hoskin was walking his horse, was, t was sitting on a horse with grain, a bag of grain, and he was walking across Goonlay's Downs, which is, this is Goonlay's Downs, in the time of Charles I. Now Charles I was 1625, so we're in the f very early years of, of his reign. And as he came across the top, because it was so undermined by the mining of, you know, the tinner's activity, um, a huge block of ground started to move and he and his horse were precipitated to, down to sea level. And the amazing thing is, they both survived. They stayed on their horses. <laughs> and he and the horse walked away unharmed because it was such an enormous block of ground. It was like a, you know, it was, it was like some sort of escalator. Yeah. And he went down on this block of ground, right down to sea level. Amongst the photographs that were in the Whitworth collection held at the museum at St Agnes, um, were a couple that I just couldn't believe. And they showed my great-great-grandfather in later years, um, effectively in retirement, um, taking the helm of a vessel for the Whitworth family. So this, this photo shows him on the helm with a bun in hand, just as we've got our bit of cake here now. And um, uh, another shot here showing him you know, getting on board inside St Agnes Harbour. And I couldn't believe it when those turned up. It was fantastic. You're clearly very passionate about the history of St Agnes, and particularly this little museum. Well, this is the product of a huge number of local heroes, I would say. And I think it probably started with Bill Morrison, the old postmaster, who, with a man called John King, had the idea of a little room, as he was describing it at the time, in the 1970s, a place where they could bring out a number of little artefacts and tell the story of St Agnes. It didn't, uh, didn't happen. Um, and, and yet, some few years later, about 1983, Bill was one of the founding members in the first committee that was put together and a group of us got, got together and we uh, started raising a few pennies to try and make this dream happen. And then three years later, in 1986, we opened our first museum in Peterville, um, thanks to, to John and Di Stevens, who um, for a modest uh, lease, a modest rent, we were able to use the, an unused floor that they hadn't got to, to, to using just at that time. Bill was the, the, the man who sowed the seed. And then a group of us, John Saul in particular, um, very influential in getting the whole thing off the ground. And, and then I could name loads of them. And since then, I mean, the museum has got an enormous collection. We've got over 60 volunteers working for us in various capacities. 
at the museum. So it, it's a place that loads of us hold very dear, and we've sunk hours of our time into it. And, and it is a, a collective effort, definitely, you know, absolutely that. So there's a story with every one of these photographs, and you know, you look at there's chops looking down the length of a board. You know, there's some lovely stuff here. Yeah, this is Trevor Trevor Greenslade. This was one of his um, little tricks, I gather, that he used to do. There's more to be done on this surfing uh, exhibition. We're really trying to find some of the very early um, uh, 1960s homemade boards, the very early ones, sort of like 1963, around that period. So tell us about the Lady Agnes. How did she come home? The story that we unearthed through, really starting through photographs, was um, the story of the ship, which was built on St Agnes Beach, um, and the way in which... Uh, in 1931, she lost her figurehead owing to a crash, a collision in Hull. And the figurehead was then refurbished and became a tradable, collectible item. The ship went on to end its days in North Wales, in Porth Maddock, but the figurehead lived on. And so we have photographs of the figurehead in various locations, Newquay, Foy, um, and then unknown locations, and then finally in a catalogue um, for Christie's Auction House. Eventually that buyer put the figurehead up for sale, and by uh, really a coincidence in a way, but I suppose a network of people were then alerted to the fact that this figurehead uh, was coming onto the market. And so we, we managed to get in early and make, a, make an offer. Well, I suppose there are hidden heroes with the harbour. You know, if you think back to the days when it stood, the people who involved, who were involved as adventurers, merchant adventurers, they were the ones who sunk money into it. Their, their ambition was clearly to make some money in facilitating the mining industry in the area and starting up a pilchard fishery, amongst other things. But it was hugely ambitious, particularly as there were four failed attempts at building a harbour prior to the one that they eventually succeeded in, in bringing off. But even that was doomed, you know, ultimately, um, without a lot of money to maintain it. I mean, it lasted, you know, nearly 120 years in its final form, I suppose. Um, it was a success up to a point, but it was a really difficult harbour. Most unlikely spot for a harbour. Nature didn't want it, so that's, that's why it's a tumble of blocks now. There was a lot of European aid trying to inspire new economic growth, and we thought that there might be a case that could be made to, to rebuild some form of harbour that would offer um, some economic benefit to the locality. But, you know, engineering-wise, the studies that we carried out show that we could do it. But when you consider how many harbours there are in Cornwall that all need support and investment and maintenance, the idea of building another one in such an unlikely north coast location was really not uppermost in the minds of the grant aiding bodies. So the case that we had to make to them in terms of an, an, an economic benefit was really very weak. And we realised that most of the people involved in the project were looking through rose-tinted spectacles, really, at the idea of having a new harbour in St Agnes. I was just thinking about um, the fishing competition that oh, you yeah. organise every year. When did yeah, that Yeah, the fishing competition. Yeah, that one, it was really just a way of trying to get people to experiment with a bit more than just mackerel and pollock. And we knew there was loads out here. So um, that started in 1977. And, uh, yeah, we've been doing it ever since, you know, we've, we've got, you know, some people have done it virtually every year, and, um, no, it's definitely, it's, it's quite a f phenomenon. But it's like a sample that we do once a year of what's on the go, and it's quite interesting how you'll find there are different things that come through. So when we get a brand new species that we haven't seen before in our competition, quite often you'll get more than one of them come in on the same day. How long has there been a lifeboat station here? 
1968, same year as the boat came down, my little boat, um, 1968, the lifeboat came along. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we've all had some involvement in that, I suppose, when I say all. My father was involved as a launcher back in the early days. He did very little um, at sea. There were reasons for that, but um, I had a spell in the lifeboat. But these guys now, you know, they, the training they do and the professionalism is fantastic. Um, you know, the medal that Gavin won recently, you know, just, just really puts that into context and uh, demonstrates how, how vital it is, I think, to keep a boat here. Yeah, that's the first right. effort, which was a pretty ropey one. But... Um, they, they get better, and that's the one I arrived at. Well, it was really as a result of going to Cadgwith that I met Nigel Legg, who makes pots and has done, his family have done for generations. And he inspired me and demonstrated and sort of helped me understand the intricacies of it. And so I'm only learning, but I'm having great fun making proper old style with the pots, having made all sorts of plastic and metal and wire versions over the years. I thought with all this push to get plastic out of the sea, let's have a go at some withy ones. And I put one in the water the other day and I was delighted. I had the first pull and there was a lovely lobster in there and I was thrilled. I'm chuffed to bits with that. I'm, I'm gonna try and perfect and hone my skills <laughs> so that I can emulate Nigel. Great grandfather apparently used to whistle for seals, and um, I was told this by an aged relative of mine who went out with him as a young girl, and she said that she could remember this was from the harbour, um, and he was sailing as an old man into his 80s, and people used to worry about him, you know, going out in in his boat, um, and he would sail out and, and go fishing, and he took uh, this aged relative who was telling me when she was a girl out around the coves here to I guess Seal Hole or one of the others that have seals in and apparently she said he whistled and before long there were five seals around the boat now I guess he was feeding them and that's the only reason they came and you're not supposed to do that these days they wouldn't advocate it but I guess he'd sort of um, fed them and got them used to the idea of associating a whistle with his boat so he was able to whistle for seals which I thought was quite a nice little story. So 11 o'clock Christmas day, Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nearly 300 people and you won't see me here. <laughs> Christmas Day at 11 o'clock. It's an epic swim. Can you feel it? And we're in. <laughs> 